Good morning. You won't hear as much from me today as you have in recent weeks, as Martin is going to be speaking to us in a moment. So I'm going to read Acts chapter 4 to you, the continuing story of the healing of the man who was lame after an opening hymn, and then I'm going to come back later and lead our prayers and final blessing. We're going to start there with a familiar hymn, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven. chapter 4. Now, as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of men came to be about 5,000. And it came to pass on the next day that their rulers, elders and scribes, as well as Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John and Alexander, and as many as were of the family of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they'd set them in front of their midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? And then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he's been made well, let it be known to you all that to the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has now become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other but there is no name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marvelled and they realised that they'd been with Jesus. And seeing the man who'd been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For indeed, that a notable miracle had thus been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no man in this name. So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them because of the people, since they all glorified God for what had been done. 
for the man was over 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. And being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So, when they heard this, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth of your servant David said, Why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate and the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hands to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And When they prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul, and neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them, and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold, and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each as anyone had need. And Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. Good morning, everybody. We're going through a series of looking at the book of Acts and last week Janet took us through Acts chapter 3 and left us halfway through the story of the lame man being healed which continues into Acts chapter 4. In Acts chapter 3 by way of review there was a lame man who was sitting at one of the gates to the temple asked for some money from Peter and John as they went into the temple and rather than giving him money, they gave him something so much more wonderful, they healed him so that he could now walk after he'd been lame from birth for round about 40 years. And then after they'd healed him, people gathered round and Peter delivered a sermon to them. I've got here a picture of the temple and you'll see the beautiful gate where it happened was round about here. And it's a gate between the court of the women and the court of the Gentiles. And so this is the area of the temple that anybody could go to because the women, the Jews and the Gentiles could all go into the main court. The court of the Gentiles and men and women, if they were Jewish, could go through the gate into the court of the women and then the men could go on into the inner parts of the temple building. And so this happened at the really busy part where the money changers were, were there, the visitors were there, the Jewish people were there to pray and indeed all the sightseers because this was a tourist attraction so they'd be all gathering in the court of the Gentiles to take their selfies and to say that they've been to this wonder of the world and then the sermon by Peter took place in Solomon's porch which was on the edge here still in the gentle area so there was a massive number of people that could hear this sermon and so that's what happened in Acts chapter 3 and the story moves on in Acts chapter 4 and the first part of the story is Peter and John being arrested the first example of Christian persecution. Now, as they spoke, as Peter was giving his sermon, as, as Peter and John are talking to the people around them, the priests, the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. They were greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached 
in Jesus, the resurrection from the dead. So we've got three groups of people here. We've got the priests who are the religious leaders, but also the representatives of the high priests. We've got the captain of the temple, who some think is a Roman appointment. So this could be representing the Jewish people and the Sadducees. The Sadducees were one of the two main leading groups in the Jewish people at the time. We've come across the Pharisees a lot during the Gospels. The Pharisees were meticulous about the law, about the Jewish law, and they wanted it to be kept. They were really, really keen on following absolutely every detail of the Old Testament. The Sadducees were an alternative group and you may have heard the saying that they didn't believe in the resurrection and that is why they were sad, you see, which is a, a way of remembering which group is which. But the Sadducees weren't quite of the same group as the Pharisees. The Sadducees were really the, the elite, the upper class, the wealthy, the rich, the influential and powerful. There weren't as many of them, but they were the, the leaders of the day, the inner cabinet and so the Tory government, if you like, they were the people of influence and they were grumpy that Peter was talking about the resurrection because they didn't believe in the resurrection. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. That's interesting because under Jewish law, you couldn't have a trial after dark. So they've arrested them in the evening and they wait for the trial for the next day. It's interesting because that is one of the laws that they broke not that many weeks earlier when they arrested Jesus and conducted a secret nighttime trial. And it then goes on to say, however, many of those who heard the word believed and the numbers of the men came to, above, came to about 5,000. You may remember... Just in chapter 2, a couple of chapters ago, they said that there were 3,000 people who believed. We're now up to 5,000. It's growing. And it's interesting that we see on the coronavirus news alert every day, graphs showing the growth in the number of people with a coronavirus infection. And there's the emphasis on the R rate, that if people don't infect one person or more, then the number of people with the virus will diminish. And if they infect more than one, it will grow. And here we have the, the daily Christian cast news alert saying we've gone from 3,000 to 5,000 in a very short space of time. The rate of Christian infection is growing. And this is the way Christianity has grown. We are meant to infect other people. I used the word not really. Um, but we are meant to be evangelising. We're meant to be presenting Jesus to people. And if every Christian um, preaches to another Christian and leads to that conversion, then there will be a growth in Christianity. And if we leave it to other people and nobody does it, if the R rate goes below one, Christianity will decline. And the fact that we are up to billions of Christians now has shown that over time, that Christianity has continued, but we all have a part to play in that. Anyway, Peter and John are arrested, but put in jail overnight. And the next day they come to the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin is the highest court in the land. It comprises of the priests, the, the Jewish leaders, the temple guard, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the elders, all the people of influence, and there are 71 of them plus the high priest. And so they're being brought without preparation for a trial before a really influential body, the most important court in the land. And they have seen just a few weeks earlier Jesus being taken for a trial, which resulted in his execution, even though he was clearly not guilty. And it must have been a worrying thing for them. And it says that they, the rulers, elders and scribes, as well as Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John and Alexander, 
and as many were of the family of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. Annas had been the high priest and he was from the Aaron line entitled to be a priest. But when the Romans took over, they sacked him from his office and replaced him with Caiaphas, who was a Roman appointee. And the chief priests include the former high priests, and there were quite a lot of them. Um, but Caiaphas and Annas both have held the, the position of high priest. And then they said to them, by what power or by what name have you done this? There needs to be a reason for putting somebody into a court and trying them. Just that you're a bit grumpy and you don't like them or they're causing a bit of unrest. Maybe the, the real reason, but you need some legal reason. And the legal reason comes in the Old Testament, I'm pleased to say, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 13. Deuteronomy chapter 13 says, If there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he gives you a sign or wonder. And a sign or wonder comes to pass, of which he spoke to you, saying, Let us go after other gods, which you have not known, and let us serve them. There is no doubt there has been a sign or wonder, a miraculous healing. But there now needs to be in, an inquiry into whether that sign or wonder is to lead us to another god away from the true god or whether it is done in the name of the true god that's the charge that's the inquiry they need to make and if it's found that it wasn't leading you after the true god the prophet or the dreamer shall be put to death it carries a death penalty if you're doing a sign or wonder that isn't leading you to god so that's the charge Now Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit and said to them, If this day are judged for a good deed, sorry, rulers of the people of elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. So Peter starts off not trying to endear himself to the group by saying you crucified Jesus and Jesus was raised from the dead. Remember the Sadducees there don't believe in resurrection and so he's rubbing that in saying yes Jesus was resurrected. He was the person you crucified and it was by him that this man was healed. But then he goes on to say this is a stone which was rejected by you builders which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in, the na in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now the stone which was rejected by you builders is a quote from the book of Psalms. Pleased to say we're going back into the Old Testament for there. But Peter is saying, Psalm 118, verse 22, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And Psalm 118 is one of the Hillel Psalms. It's a messianic psalm, a psalm about the Messiah coming. It begins, O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Let Israel now say, his mercy endures forever. Let the house of Aaron now say, his mercy endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord now say, his mercy endures forever. I called on the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and set me in a broad place. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear what man can do. And it goes on to say the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. It's a psalm that Jesus quoted about himself. And it's a psalm that clearly refers to the Messiah. And they're saying that it's done in the name of Jesus, the Messiah, and therefore is pointing to the one true God. So through that quote, they are giving themselves a defence against the accusation in Deuteronomy chapter 13 that they're leading people away from God. And the Sanhedrin really struggled to find anything to do here. And they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived they were uneducated and untrained men and they marvelled. And they realised they'd been with Jesus. They weren't 
untrained. They had spent three years in a close group getting a detailed training from Jesus, an understanding of the Old Testament about how that pointed to him that enabled them to identify Psalm 118 as being relevant. And they also had the man who had been healed standing there smiling, saying, look, I can walk, I can walk. And they couldn't deny that had happened. And so they decide that they'll just tell them they mustn't talk about God anymore. They'll talk about Jesus. And Peter says, well, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. And all they could do there is threaten them to go away and couldn't really find any way of punishing them. And so they're sent back home. And I find it interesting, when they return, they go back to their own companions and they report everything that's happened. And if I'd just been arrested and taken before the highest court of the land, these really powerful, influential people who have the power of life and death and told, don't preach anymore, you go home, but you're under a warning, my prayer probably would be different to theirs. The prayer might be, well, let's pray that they're converted and they stop threatening me or pray that I find a safer way of doing it because I don't really want to be arrested again. But their prayer was, Lord, look on, your, on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your name. They don't pray for the situation to change. They pray for boldness in going ahead in that situation. And interestingly, they also look back to the Old Testament themselves. Again, to the book of Psalms, the servant David said, Why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. Another psalm, this time Psalm chapter 2. And I thought, I've got an extra couple of minutes, so I'll just look through Psalm chapter 2 with you, because it's a a fairly complicated psalm if you don't know how to read it. Psalm chapter 2, the Messiah's triumphant kingdom, another messianic psalm, another psalm about Jesus. And it begins, Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Clearly, this is what is happening in that day and probably for the last 2,000 years, the nations plotting against God, against Jesus. And So there, there are four people speaking here. The first people to speak are the leaders. Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us taking arms, standing up against God, saying we have nothing to do with him. And it moves on to God the Father. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. Derision at these people that think they can stand up against God. The Lord shall hold them in derision. And then he shall speak to them in his wrath. He gets angry and distressed them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion looking ahead to his son being set up as the king. And then we move on. The father's saying, I've set my king on the holy hill of Zion. And then the son, Jesus, speaks. I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me. And then Jesus quotes what the father said to him. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance at the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. And then we move on to another person speaking. I think this is coming from the the lips of the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. A warning to the world. Now, therefore, be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all those who put their trust in him. So we have two Psalms of David there. 
and I'll come back to David in a second. But let's finish off Acts chapter 4, the final part, having prayed. And as they were praying, the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the thing, the word of God with boldness. They prayed for goldness, boldness and straight away there was a response, an earthquake and they're able to speak with boldness. And they shared in all things. And it goes on to the start of the story about them looking after each other, sharing their possessions and sharing their concern for each other. And I said I'd come back to David because looking ahead at how the kings of the earth are standing against God at the moment, one of the things that's happening in our world at the moment is the response to the Black Lives Matter movement and the destruction of lots of statues around the country or being taken down. And I've been thinking about two statues and about King David. There's a statue that's been taken down today or a couple of days ago when you listen to this of Robert Baden Powell. And I'm not going to launch into a defence of Baden Powell. I don't know enough about him, but he was the founder of the Scout Movement. And it says in the original book of Scouting for Boys, we aim for the practice of Christianity in their everyday life and dealings, and not merely the profession of its theology on Sundays. Religion was fundamental to the Scout Movement that Baden Powell designed and put in place. And because of other things in his life, there are suggestions that he should no longer be honoured with a statue. And I was reminded of Julius Caesar, who has a statue in London. And I'm not here as an apologist for Julius Caesar. I'm not saying that he was a great person to follow. He is a historical figure. But in William Shakespeare's book on Julius Caesar, Mark Antony says, I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The evil that men do lives after them. The good is oft interred with their bones. So let it be with Caesar. And at the moment, there are lots of people who have done good things in their life, which are being disregarded because people are looking at the evil that they've done. And all people have done evil, apart from Jesus. And if we only look back at the bad things people have done and forget the good, our history will be distorted. And I mentioned the Psalms of David and said I'll come back to David because I'm reminded that David committed some incredibly bad things during his life, which we studied when we were looking at his life. Not least the murder of a man so that he could commit, after he committed adultery with that man's wife. And yet God forgave him for that and blotted it out of the memory of him. David was referred to as a man after God's own heart, a man that God loved, a man who was held up as an example to the world. And we could say, well, we're not going to look at David because of the bad things he did, but that's not the way God approaches it. And I think as you're looking at the things that are being said about all sorts of people that have done bad things in their life, I would just ask you to remember that God's approach to it and how God is willing to forgive and completely remove the evil that people have done and look at the good things, particularly if that good thing is the acceptance of Jesus and a love of him. And so I summarise this by saying, look at the R rate. We have a responsibility to proclaim the gospel it will be a scary thing to do and let's pray not that somebody else does it but let's pray for boldness and let's share in all things and work together in this world where the world is saying let's stand against God and fight God and God is laughing at that holding it in derision and saying no the right answer is turn to my son and look to his church on the earth, who will stand with boldness, proclaiming him. Amen. Thank you, Martin.
And now we're going to pray together, thinking through some of those things that we've just been hearing about. Father, we thank you that you are a God who forgives, that when we turn to you and accept your lordship in our lives, we are made new, new creations, the old is gone. And would you help us, in response to your love and forgiveness of us, to be people who love and forgive others. We pray now for our world, for our country, for the place where we live, that your will be done, your kingdom come. And we pray for those who are finding today particularly difficult, and especially for those known to us. Father, we pray that you will enable us to be those who cause your church to increase and not to decrease. Would you give us boldness in proclaiming the gospel, the good news that Jesus rose from the dead and that a relationship with him is possible today? We pray as those first disciples did. Give us, your servants, great boldness in preaching your word. Stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And we pray that our homes, our lives, may be places where you have first place, where you are sovereign, King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. Let's say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And now as we think of each other, let's say the grace as if we were saying it in person to one another. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. We're going to close with another song, a song which reminds us of some of the words from our reading today, which reminds us that Jesus is the cornerstone. Let's sing together if we can. Thank you and God bless until next week.
dressed in his righteousness alone Faultless stand before 